Jesus. Welcome to another episode of Around the Verse. I'm Sandy Gardner. And I'm Chris Roberts. Today we'll dive into scramble race lighting, gussying up rest stops, audio, and more. But not before checking out the latest from the in-game activities of our community. Yes, so in a timely move, an org called Overdrive from our Russian community summoned the spirit of Evakati last weekend. Using 57 Grey Cat buggies, a crew of eight invoked the Star Citizen frontline playtesters by spelling out their name on an epic scale. Good timing on their part, with Alpha 3.3 testing uh, released to the Evocati test group this past weekend. Now they continue to test the new 3.3 features and content, preparing it for a wider PTU release. Uh, they are also getting ready uh, for OCS testing to make sure it's ready to go as soon as possible. Happy testing to you all. Now, on to development updates. Here we are again at the scramble races. As the devs get these missions ready for prime time, a lot of fine tuning is underway. So right now, the mission team has been working with the lighting team to dial everything in. Here's Callum Hancock with more. So in the old setup with the asteroid arenas, we didn't used to have any kind of lighting at all. The problem was that the minute the sun went behind yellow or was shaded in any way, the players would end up running into asteroids they had absolutely no chance of seeing. You can see over here where the player comes around this asteroid, and even though the sun's out in the shade, they come around this corner and they've got no chance of seeing this other side of the asteroid. They're going straight into it, don't even realize it's there until the last minute. So to try and solve this, we ended up first trying to put in a cube map to add in lighting. We thought it looked good at first, but the lighting guys weren't too happy with it. It was putting out too much light and ended up making the arena glow a little bit too much. To try and solve this and justify it, we added in these bits of cabling here and the antennas, trying to add in some practical lights to try and make it feel justified. That still was overpowering the scene a little bit too much. So after that, we had to go back to them and speak to them again. They came back to us with another solution, which was having these low intensity, low attenuation bulbs dotted around the outside. And because the lights are set really, really low, it's not making it glow or anything. It just adds just enough lighting to be able to see. It's still nighttime. It's still going to be a challenge to see most of it. But the player never really feels like they're being cheated and they're not going to run into anything they had no chance of ever seeing at all. So that's pretty interesting. So what other areas of the game are there that we have challenges lighting up the dark? So we're looking at sort of both kind of more automated ways where we can sort of real time do uh, sort of physical, almost sort of global illumination stuff, building cube maps on the fly and stuff. Um, because what you want to do is you want to have at least a small amount of light or light bounce around so you can see things even when it's pretty dark. I mean, it's a challenge you have. And then of course, we'll do specific things depending on locations. But um, it's, it is a challenge. I mean, we're trying to light a whole universe uh, with in the game um, so you don't run into asteroids you can't see. Very cool. It's been a few weeks since we checked in on rest stops, and here we see work that the procedural tech team has done recently on various libraries. The procedural generation uh, varying color schemes go a long way, along with um, varying, obviously, the shapes. Sticking with the rest stops, here's a look at recent testing the procedural feature team has done on the approach to stations like this from a pilot's perspective. The props team uh, continues to turn out more Lawville conversation pieces. Here we see hanging clothing, trash cans, and a lot of little details that really lend the city personality. Now let's look to vehicle features. Ship teams have been busy getting onboard power plant systems up to spec. Junior gameplay programmer Jonathan Young can fill us in. So we've also been working on uh, making the power system more consistent for a player to know what's going to happen when the system doesn't have enough power. We discovered that this meant that the items turned off in order as dictated in an XML, which meant that if a dashboard is first in the XML, then all your MFDs are going to turn off. To fix that, we've added per item priorities so that designers can set which items are more important than others. For example, you might want the shields to turn off before the thrusters so you can escape, um, and you want the dashboards to turn off quite late so that you can still manage all your systems and still see what the status of your ship is. 
So tell me how um, this system affects your overall flight experience. Uh, well, I mean, basically, it's, it's uh, the power management and the management of the different items. And so you want to manage your power in a way that keeps your ship m working at optimal uh, capability. And then you could turn off certain systems so you would then for have more power available for your shields and more power available for your engines. And it would sort of go down the list. And you as a player uh, can go in there and tweak what you think the priorities are. I mean, you probably wouldn't want to put the life, life support, support down at the bottom. <laughs> uh, but the idea is to sort of manage it because you don't have to do it all. You don't have to micromanage all this if you don't want to. It will take, uh, you know, we already have priorities and, and a rule set for it. But if you do want to micromanage it, then you can sort of maximize your experience out in space or in combat. And so I think that's kind of the, the model we're going for is, you know, you should be able to get in and it should be kind of fun and simple. But if you really want to learn all the systems and tweak things and do stuff, then you can be a better pilot or a better um, you know, trader or a combat fighter or whatever. So uh, that's uh, this is a, one of the uh, aspects of that. I think I would let the ship do its thing. The audio team has been here fine-tuning the sound effects for the Karna rifle from Castec Arms, as well as tweaking weight distribution to make footsteps sound more realistic. Distinct sounds are now being triggered when a player walks backwards or sideways. Footsteps now uh, get noticeably quieter while the player is crouching and each foot has their own separate audio identity for more dynamic sound in all of these cases. The focused audio feature is applied here with footsteps amplified when the player is looking down at their feet. Finally, uh, we go to narrative director David Haddock and senior motion capture specialist Joe Ponsford for a look at a recent mocap shoot that was just done in the UK. What we're doing here is we've come out to grab some performance capture for some of the generic NPCs that the players will be sort of coming across in some of our landing zones. This is where we shoot in motion capture, audio and facial simultaneously in one complete system. So we're using LTC timecode to basically create a sync between the four separate systems. And then we have a private own application where we look to sync the facial with the motion capture and with the audio. So when we press trigger, it passes the record and it also passes the take name as well. What we do is we record video reference at the same time as we're shooting. We track the takes that have been made by Director Select. These are based on the time code. So we can ensure that as soon as Director says, okay, I want it from this time point, uh, we track it from there and then we pass it on to the animation team. The animation team then do a complete polish and then this gets put straight into the game engine. That looked like fun, I miss mocap. Uh, yeah, and it was a, a, a little week shoot that was done at the very beginning of this month. Um, Dave was over there with Will Weisbaum. We had some stuff that we needed to pick up for 3.3 um, and now what we're calling 3.35. Some general stuff for some of the FPS AI as well as stuff for Lawville for this up and coming uh, quarter that we'll do at start at CitizenCon. I like it. Yeah, speaking of this 3-3 part for CitizenCon, there are less than 50 tickets left for CitizenCon 2948, and we would love to see you there on October 10th in Austin. So grab one while you still can. And if you happen to be in France the weekend of October 12th and 13th, our French community is organizing a fan-driven event in Orly called Paris Vefs. And it looks like it's going to be a great event, uh, similar to community-organized meetups like uh, Britison Con uh, in the UK and Con42, which was just recently held this past weekend in Germany. Uh, they have activities and tournaments planned and tickets are still available. So if you're going to be in the area, uh, you should check it out. And I think there's a rumor that Brian Chambers may go there. Ooh, um, Brian Chambers. On his way back from Citizen Con. So there you go, very popular is Brian Chambers. And that's it for us this week. Don't forget to tune into Reverse the Verse live tomorrow at noon Pacific on Twitch. Yeah, and thanks to all the subscribers, as well as each and every backer. Until next time, we will see you around, around the verse. verse. Thanks for watching. For the latest and greatest in Star Citizen and Squadron 42, you can subscribe to our channel, or you can check out some of the other shows, and you can also head to our website at www.robertsspaceindustries.com. Thank you very much for watching.